The Cardinals franchise in 2028 rolls on today. Welcome back to the series, everybody. Big games right out the gate today with the 42-win Cardinals and the 42-win Dodgers. Now, a series in June usually doesn't carry too much weight, but wanted to highlight this because we've already lost three games to the Dodgers already. So this is a chance for them to own a tiebreaker over us, which could determine seeding later in the year. We have a big lead right now in the Central. I'm not going to go over too many of these games unless something really piques my interest. Ideally, today we get to the Home Run Derby and have a chance to play that with Nolan Gorman, maybe the All-Star game as well, and see where this team is heading into the postseason stretch run with the trade deadline now a month and a half away. The offense has been unbelievable this year. So many players hitting above 300 or near 300, and there's power to go with that efficiency. 226 hitting Luis Robert has just started to get hot after being the coldest hitter in the lineup, and we'll see if he's able to reclaim a early spot in the order again. And the pitching is getting hot at the same time. Corbin Burns has been very steady. Nestor Cortez could be in the mix for a Cy Young this year with the way he's been playing. You could see Nolan Gorman potentially win an MVP this season. So a lot going right for our cards and hopefully things stay that way. But if we lose any of these games to the Dodgers, they win the season series. Nolan Gorman goes yard in the first game. Dylan Lesko is going to give up a third run in the sixth inning. And he's going to exit with the Dodgers in front. We could only score one run, though, and the Dodgers take it, meaning the rest of this series doesn't mean a whole lot. The Dodgers will own any tiebreaker over us this season. And we're going to close this season series against the Dodgers with just one win in six games. Obviously not good play against one of the teams you're probably going to have to beat come postseason. Now we go right into this Milwaukee series. It looks like the bats really start to heat up. Seven, eight, nine runs as we do win our fourth consecutive. And Jordan Walker, two home runs for him, but two going to Daryl Marino. We can mash this year. Oh, the Nationals made a big move. They have traded Dylan Cruz for Tristan Casas. Two mid to high 80s rated players, but they swap an infielder for an outfielder or vice versa, but they're not really a threat here, so you'd more so think this move maybe favors what the Red Sox are trying to do. I don't know, they're both under 500 being weird. We seem to have Milwaukee's number this year. We swept them, then got swept at home by the Blue Jays, then go on the road to sweep the Brewers all over again. We have sent the Brewers to the NL Central's basement. Now, they often get off to poor starts in this series and then climb their way back up, but this might be too much to overcome. But nobody else in this division right now is playing above 500. It's a 10-game lead in late June. Now, earlier this season, I highlighted a series against the Miami Marlins, and we were able to take two out of three in that series. And that's another team where you could look at possible tie-breaking scenarios coming into play. So Miami needs to score some wins in this meeting, but we take the first game, meaning one more, and we're going to own this season series. We don't want to be losing all of them to the teams we could be in tiebreaker scenarios with. Robert with a triple and a home run. He continues to deliver for this offense, and he's now... 227, so it hasn't changed significantly. And I think hitting him ninth when the rest of the lineup is performing like that makes the most sense. We'll jump into the end of this game. Corbin Burns is looking for a complete game shutout that would clinch a season series. Oh, these uniforms are different. I kind of like them, actually. They're a little strange, but I like them. Hit out to right field, Brandon Drury will fly out, and only two outs to go for Corbin Burns, who has thrown 78 pitches, that is it. And he's got plenty in the tank as Abrams will try to get the Marlins a base runner. 
Perfect change up and already ahead. And got him looking on the slider. Brett Beatty will try to extend the game. He is hitless and it's strike one. And then he clips the outer edge and it's an 0-2 count. He's just been pumping in strikes and it's lifted out to right field. That should stay in the park. And that is the ball game as Corbin Burns goes the distance for a complete game shutout. Gorman with a pair of homers the next day. I hope he's getting ready for the Derby because that's coming up. We are two weeks away, but the Nationals have given us a call. They want to offer us a trade, the trade of the way. One player already today, Dylan Cruz. And now they like to give us Kyle Schwarber for one bin show. But Schwarber's down to a 73 overall. He can still supply some power. Like, if there were room for him to DH, it would make a little sense. He is having a really good season. I don't think this is a bad offer at all. Like, I think it's actually really good for them to acquire a prospect similar overall, but a lot younger. But I, I don't see Rue on the roster unless we moved on from Melendez. I guess it's one to keep in mind, but I'm going to decline that for the time being. Two weeks until the home run derby. How likely is it we see Gorman in that? Shohei with 30 home runs. Gorman has 26. And then Rafael Devers, 29, meaning he's currently in third. And he's got a, a bit of a lead as well in third place. So it's looking promising. It looked like the Cubs might be a team that competes for the division title with us based on the first couple weeks of play, but it has not maintained. Now, Chicago is able to take this series, but we'll at least salvage the finale before meeting up with Philadelphia, who has seemed to take a step back this year, and they're still behind the Marlins, but now the Braves have popped back up into first place out east, so that's still anybody's division, even the Mets. We are now number two in Team ERA. After opening the season, not even in the top half of the league, we were really not pitching that great at the start. The Phillies' ERA is still really good. And you see the Marlins there, the Dodgers as well. A lot of good pitching in the National League. Let's go to just, well, home runs. The, the Dodgers have been incredible this year hitting homers. Shohei leading the league certainly helps. We are currently in ninth place. And then for just run score, Dodgers are top in the NL. But uh, the Twins, 490, they are the best right now. While the Phillies are currently, yeah, down here at 21st. That explains why they've been 500 this year. But we're going to play four here in St. Louis. The Cardinals have won the opener 5-3. Brandon Marsh against the team he left in the offseason has a triple, a homer, and three RBIs as Corbin Burns goes six and a third with a win. Yeah, I'm not seeing a whole lot of reason to slow things down here. I think we can continue to breeze through this part of the schedule as we are dominating the Phillies in this meeting. Two homers in this game for Luis Robert Jr. and the average has climbed up to 237. Heading in the right direction. Lesko goes six. His ERA is on the way down. Jojo Romero, a one two six. He's probably in line for an all-star appearance. And now Mason Wynn has suffered an injury. He has broken his shin out one to two months. So we'll have to respond to that. For now, putting him on the 10-day injured list as we swept Philadelphia. Really big series win for us, and if we play six times this year, then we've already won that season series as well, but we're also 13 games better than them right now in the standings. So, Mason Wynn, broken shin. He had been hitting 181, and after slugging really well early in the year, that has come down back under, you know, even a good mark or a relatively good mark. So we need to find an infielder then to replace him. And there's a guy down at AAA that makes sense. We could look to bring up Donald Galvin potentially. He would be making his debut. 
his potential is right around his overall. So he's about as good as he's going to be. And I think that he has good enough ratings to both slide into the lineup, play in the field, and just hold it down on days we need him. And we've already used his option this year even better. So he can come back up and Galvin's going to be making a major league debut. Speaking of guys who have been great down at AAA this year, let's check in now. Benny Matsumoto is a 78 overall. We like the development this year. Home run per nine is now an 87. At 78, you're wondering, when does he get a chance to pitch at the bigs? And the spot that's kind of been in question is Tink Hentz's spot in the rotation with him not really playing great last year and then not getting off to uh, an amazing start this season either. Good to see he's developing, and overall, Hentz does have better ratings. It's just the home run per nine makes up so much of Matsumoto's overall right now, whereas Hentz is better across the board, and if he's in good form, I'd rather have him in the rotation. I'm still open to the idea of Benny joining the team in September, now, when we go to the postseason, I usually go to a four-man rotation anyway. So that fifth spot, not really a, a huge postseason talking point. And if we have a massive lead already in the division, then we have to see if, like, I think that move could really be the difference between a one, two, or a three seed. As long as we get a first-round bye, I would feel pretty good about things. Dodgers have 56 wins. We have 57. The Marlins only 48. So right now you'd pencil in us and LA not playing in the wild card. So we're just going to elevate another third baseman then to AAA. And this is last year's first round pick, Julian Welsh, who's already a 70 overall. And he's been hitting really well down at AA with an 899 OPS hitting 314 with six home runs and no errors in the field. Donald Galvin has been called up, and he will start against lefties. And we're facing one right away in Blake Snell, so he will make his debut. The Pirates are 46 and 46. They should be firmly in the wild card conversation. And in a lot of divisions, you end up seeing like a first place team that's played outstanding and a second place team that is probably, you know, on the level of a division leader. But it doesn't seem that there's a second place team that's even close to that conversation this year. So it could go any number of ways for the wild card race. Here's Blake Snell with an ERA above five and a whip at 176 and a 16% walk rate. And Donald Galvin will make his debut. Top of the second inning. Galvin wearing number 15. And his MLB career has begun right down the middle from Blake Snell. Galvin was our first round pick of the year three draft. So it's his second professional season. He's made this jump relatively quickly. He had a really high overall to begin his career. And it's 1-2. And got him. It's a slider low. And Snell picks up the strikeout. They're not giving him anything in the field yet. So on to the fifth and still scoreless. On a good day for Blake Snell. All right. One strikeout already. This time we have to lay off the curve. On the ground and through, Donald Galvin is on the board with his first big league hit. Check it out, our base coach has taken Albert Pujol's number now. Now let's see if we can bring the rookie around to score. And it's a steal situation. You want me to take off right here? You sure about this? All right. Galvin goes, and he is out. They were insisting that we attempt to steal. It's not my fault. Home run, Jordan Walker. I wish we were out there to see it, but 2-0 St. Louis anyway. Give us at least one defensive play, though, guys. Colin Holderman is now in the game for Pittsburgh. 
under this one and just missed it. That was close. They got Ben Joyce. I don't even want to see that fastball. 5 nothing though. St. Louis leading. That is fast. And it was only 99. 100 that time. And then can't get a piece of that slider. That was a nice one to drive. Ben Joyce has struck out Donald Galvin. And will the ninth inning give us any defense? Absolutely not. Cardinals win 5-0. to zero. So Galvin makes his debut. He'll help hold third base down here for the time being while Mason Wynn recovers. And we approach the all-star break. We have now reached the first year player draft. And I haven't been covering the draft very much. But we'll at least run through the players I end up taking. We won't spend too much time on this. It's unlikely these players end up factoring into the core of the franchise. As I think about where the series is right now, I think this is going to be our last regular season of going through things in this fashion. And depending on how a potential postseason run goes, then I'll think about how much more of the Cards franchise we're going to do. But ending things in October was always kind of my plan. The Rockies open the draft by taking a starting pitcher in Ryan McLeod. I'm not going to have any information on these picks because we pick so much later. And I just prioritized guys that are going to be in like that 20 to 40 range because we do have two picks after another Rookie of the Year performance nets us that prospect performance incentive. So the board didn't change much getting to our first selection at 26. The highest ranked player on our board is number 14, Porter Chance, a starting pitcher who just looks pretty solid all the way around. Nothing too high, nothing too low. I guess velocity does look, you know, he is a slow pitcher. His fastball tops out at like 90. So I guess that's uh, an interesting skill set for today's game. But he is the best player on the board, and despite not being much of a velocity pitcher, he is going to be our selection. And we're set to pick again now at 31. We're going to go with an infielder here with our number 31 selection. It's going to be Kenny Perez. Came in 41st on our board, and he's a good defender with speed. His offense, though, needs a lot of development. It doesn't project to be great, but if his potential range is solid, then I think it can be developed still. Now we're in the second round. A couple of my options are off the board. I did like Maurice Peters, but 67 to 92 potential wasn't a, a great range. I always scouted him halfway. I felt like he might have that really high ceiling, but... Was hoping he'd be here in the second round. That was uh, wishful thinking. So we're going to go with another outfielder then in Mikey Deal, who's really good with defense and speed and probably won't be a star, but could be a serviceable player if he makes it up to the show. And not to mention, he's got a high overall starting point because he was a four-year college player. The board is shrinking significantly as I really just focused on getting those early picks right. So we're going to take some chances now and we're going to go with Rocky Damon. He is a left-handed pitcher who does have really good velocity. Throws a cutter. I always like when pitchers have a cutter in their arsenal. A little bit of Juco experience and 96th on our board, but really didn't scout him a whole lot. And the rest of the draft will be a lot of guesses. Running a little bit low on time here, but we're going to go with a reliever now. This is Felix Salas. I like the experienced relievers that might not need nearly as much time to make it to the majors. Although his overall starting point, you know, could still be pretty low. Then we're going to take Estevan Garcia because I can't find anybody I'm super interested in right now. And he at least has an overall range I think is worth taking a look at or the potential range. And then we'll add more to our infield depth with Alexi De La Rosa to finish things off. And hopefully soon we see what those players look like then. Draft pick Alexi De La Rosa has an injury that will affect their long-term potential and current overall rating. I've never gotten that notification before. 
It is the last day now before the All-Star break, and we have a healthy lead in the Central, but I want to see if we're in good shape for Gorman to make the Derby or if he might need one or two more. 27 puts him in second place in the NL. Yep, he should be in the Derby this season. And we're going to end the first half with a 60-36 and 36 record. That is incredible. 625 win percentage. 7-3 and three going into the deadline. Gorman leads us in homers. Walker has 16. Contreras with 16. Marsh with 15. The team is in such good shape right now. It's... It's pretty fun to see the way things are developing this year. Daryl Marino is locked in. He's hitting for a 780 OPS right now. That's good progress in his first full year. Geraldo Perdomo still over a 300 average with a 393 on base percentage. Our on base numbers are just ridiculous. There's got to be traffic on the base pass nearly every inning. And then Nestor Cortez. He's going to finish the first half as our number one pitcher. I hope he got rewarded with an all-star appearance. Let's take a look at the voting as Cortez is the number three starter. And then Jojo Romero looks to be making it in this year. You got William Contreras, the number one catcher. Jordan Walker, could he make it? He's the number two first baseman. Gorman, number one second baseman over Nico Horner. Perdomo, fourth at short. That's not bad considering the names here and how many good shortstops there are. I'm saying we're doing the all-star game and home run derby at Target Field this season. All right, so I'm going to go with three minutes then. That was the format this season in MLB. I didn't even watch the home run derby. That was when College Football 25 came out, and I don't remember anything but that game for a month. And here's your field of eight incredible power-hitting players competing for the coveted home run derby title. To anybody top Shohei Otani, though. Thankfully, we are not matched up with him. We've got Gunnar Henderson in the first round. Oh, we're next. I was expecting a little more of a wait. Gunnar Henderson hit 14, and we get off to a fast start. Gorman, deep to right field, onto the pavilion, and gone for 44. Three swings in my first derby on this game, and Nolan Gorman has already reached bonus time. Now he's going to try going left center with this. And it is gone, not even close. What a start, that probably won't go. And yeah, that's just a double. So the pace we need here, five a minute would get us to the next round. And so far we're on that mark. Gorman, right center. And that is gonna get way up there, 470. Are you kidding me? I might have to call timeout. There's no way this guy can just keep doing that. 450. And now we're going to go to center field. Get it up and over the batter's eye, please. Oh, my. Way up there. 460. You know, I expected a lot of homers, but the distance is obnoxious. I think we're going to call timeout there. We're halfway through the round. And what a start. I love the interacting with the other players. That's pretty cool. Right field and back at it with a deep home run. Give me 450 plus. 436. Should I let one of these go? Like, usually you can't just swing over and over and hit home runs every time, can you? Just can't. Can't miss right now. 461 for Nolan Gorman. Left center now. 50 seconds on the clock. That is 
We're giving souvenirs to spots you would never expect to see one fly. This to tie it and gone. Just one more. And that's going to be it. Dominating the first round is Nolan Gorman. They should have let him go first. He hit the scoreboard. He hit himself to move on. That is the most electric home run derby performance I've seen in MLB this show. Now, the semifinals, I don't think that it's actually matchups. I think the top two just advance, if I'm not mistaken. I, I skimmed the rules. I didn't read them in depth. I guess I'm a little intrigued if Pete Alonzo or Shohei Otani get eliminated because these would be two guys you would favor if they weren't matched up with each other. You know Alonzo's going to get the, the full bonus time and everything. This is... 440 is too easy for him. I got to say, though, his pace is a little sloppy. I've seen a few go foul. You might be able to see them scattered along the, the fence. And he's had a couple near misses. And now back-to-back -back fouls here down the line. That's probably not going to beat Shohei as he misses one. Alonzo just struck out in the derby. Back-to-back -back fouls and then missed one. 11 probably ain't going to cut it. You know, Shohei's round hasn't been all that impressive either. Someone's got to advance, though. Shohei has missed a few in a row, and now he's going to send out number nine. I don't know if the bonus time has already been added on or not, but he trails by two. The clock is at zero, and that is number 10. Now he gets bonus time. So it does favor Otani as he goes deep for 54. He just needs one more. That's foul. Might get one or two more swings at it. That could go right center. And Otani is moving on. Rafael Devers, Jordan Alvarez, Nolan Gorman, Shohei Otani. That is an excellent derby field. I'm going to watch these derby performances because I don't want to have to compete against the simulated number. I want to see what I'm up against. Alvarez putting in a solid round, but has yet to unlock that bonus time. That could be it, though. 461. We don't really know what Gorman could have done in that first round because he went second. He just had to beat Henderson. But Alvarez is putting up a score that could very well advance him. Final swing, and Alvarez hits it foul. He will finish with 17. Now it is Rafael Devers' turn. This one's going to be close. Devers sitting at 13. That is a long pop-up. That's the time waster right there. Pop-up by home run derby standards. He needs four in bonus time. I guess the bonus time clock doesn't quite start yet. Now it does. And he trails by three. But these swings take more time than you'd probably think. So there's not room for two misses. And that's what he opens with. And there's just not enough time. It's going to be Jordan Alvarez topping Devers. All right, I guess it is just regular bracket play. I thought it was, you know, head-to-heads and then it was top two advance. So we got to beat Shohei Otani. But we are at least going to set the pace. And we get off to a strong start, headed out to right center, 428. And trying to hit the exact same spot. Further back, though, 456. Crushed to center now by Gorman. That gets out. And we send one more towards left center. 
And that is three in a row to open, four in a row to open the round. That was bad pitch. That wasn't even a strike. Line shot, I don't know. No. We don't want three in a row missing. Oppo field and oh, in the first row. I think five a minute though is a good pace regardless. And we're on that. That might not have enough. No, just in front. Again, low pitch. I want them a little more elevated. Well, that's seven. Yep, that sound is going to be what you want. And that's a deep oppo one for Gorman, 435. No bonus time yet. We've got to send one more in this area to get that 440. And that achieves it just fine. Yeah, what was that? I'm taking my time out because we got to talk about some of these pitches you're throwing. That's more like it. And that's 4.38. We have bonus time, so another minute still. You gotta like that sound over and over again. 4.52. We had the 4.70 in round one. I'm not sure we're gonna challenge that one again. Now we send one more so down the line. That's gonna be a fair ball. 4.69. Again, outside, we're going to see if we can go oppo with it, though. And it does leave. One more. And that's going to head out to left center and get out of here. 17 is a pretty efficient score. And now we see if Shohei Otani can put up a little bit better round. Or if Gorman moves on to the finals. That sounded good. It's not going to be foul. That is 474. His first homer is longer than any of the ones we've hit. What is Shohei doing between rounds? 437. I'm already getting nervous. Shohei is coming out of the gates. Red hot to start his round. Bonus time achieved. Five a minute is a good pace. He's gotten five in the first minute. We need like a good three, four swing stretch of no homers. Oh, that's huge. Especially those warning track shots because you watch them until they hit the ground. Those eat up a couple extra seconds compared to like a line drive miss. Every second counts. There we go. Inside out. That's not going to go. A minute 30 left to go. I think he's got enough swings to do it, but he can't afford many misses. That hits the, the pitching screen. It's starting to look favorable. That doesn't get out. That hurts. That's like three pitches in a row. And that's foul. The start was great, but Shohei could not maintain the pace. And Gorman is advancing to the finals. Jordan Alvarez also hit 17 in the previous round, and he will set the pace. First swing not being a home run helps. We're wrapping up the first minute. Alvarez will get number three. But so far, not a huge pace and no 440s. Getting hot, though. This is going to be his third straight 421. I think that bonus time is going to be huge. Not having those 30 seconds. Ooh, and making sure you get the, the fair foul luck on your side, too. That could be a 440. That one is 414. Okay, not quite. He's only going to get maybe one more swing. 419. And one more. That could be it, though. Alvarez at the buzzer, 456, what a swing. He's got 30 more seconds. That should be fair, 380. 
What a performance for your Don Alvarez. At 15, two swings probably left. And with the bonus time, he'll get one more. And that is gone. Two homers in bonus time. We have to beat 16. And here we go. Trying to claim the Home Run Derby Championship. I'm having a little bit of a tough time on some of these pitches. It's like blending in with that facing. Not too much of an impact yet. But I could see it throwing off a couple swings. That's 453. Four swings. Four Nolan Gorman home runs. Center field, can I get 440? 433. This is an incredible start to the round. In the first minute, we've got six. I don't think that goes. Oh, it does. Then we go oppo. That's the furthest to left he's gone as far as close to that foul pole. Is this really like nine straight? You gotta let time like not even be a factor here. Just let him go until he can't do it anymore. That was low and away. And he still sends it 399. Is this for real right now? We have not missed. Let's take a break. No, that missed. That's perfect time for the timeout. So we are also needing that 440. And we got a minute and change to get it. No, that doesn't go. That's not a home run swing. Bad and right center. No. 50 seconds. Come on, Gorman. He misses again. We need a 440. This was so good to start. Back on the board, four to tie. But he doesn't have bonus time unlocked yet. That is 454. Massive. And then he's going right back for more into center field. 461. Two to tie, and that should be 15. And that is going to right. Next one wins. 30 seconds, let this one go. That's a good pitch though. And that is your winner. Nolan Gorman, home run champion. His longest homer is the Derby ceiling homer. That was electric stuff from Nolan Gorman. And hopefully it's not the only piece of hardware we're taking home this year. That was a lot of fun. 472 at the very end. I think that was worth the wait. And now it's on his award page for good. Nestor Cortez is the only pitcher we have this year in the All-Star game. Gorman, William Contreras, and I guess that's it for All-Stars. How did Alonzo make it? I thought that Walker had more votes. And there he is, fresh off the home run derby victory. Gorman versus Shane McClanahan in the All-Star game. Come on, McClanahan, 3-1. Of course he walks the guy that just won the Derby. William Contreras, though, hitting right behind him. I do like the back-to-back -back Cardinals. I didn't even do that myself. That's probably a home run if I can actually see the ball. This is such a hard time of day to hit in target field. Strike three for Contreras. Now let's jump back in now with Nolan Gorman facing Logan Gilbert. 
Again, I love that pitch if I could just see it. And that's hit on the ground to short. Now let's get Nasty Nestor in there for an inning now. What a great first half and what a great signing he's been. I thought by now we could see maybe someone pushing for his spot. Wasn't sure if he'd be, you know, great for multiple years. It's kind of a risk whenever you add a new pitcher you're unfamiliar with, but he's been, you know, our best pitcher this season and very good the rest of the time. He's also our only lefty starter. So we get to attack hitters a little bit differently when he's out there. One and two. Got him! Strike three on Alvarez. Now we have the home run derby champion, Nolan Gorman, but the home run leader is actually Rafael Devers. 34 on the season. 0 oh and 2. And a piece of the slider. Popped up. Jake Berger going to give this a look. And makes the catch across the railing. All right. We might be getting to a point where I can see the ball coming in now. So much better. I still missed it. And fishing at the slider. He just keeps throwing it. All right, Gorman, we might get one more shot here. I want to get at least one good swing with one of our players. And we face Mackenzie Gore. Gore versus Gorman. Ah, oh, man, I've been late on these. I'm so used to the home run balls now. At that speed. They were coming in super slow. Left center. Hit fairly well, respectable at least, but caught. Up the middle, and William Contreras singles in the sixth. There we go. A drive by Ryan Mountcastle. I think it's going to go. Home run for the National League as we take a 4 to nothing advantage. And I'm giving Gorman one more in the seventh inning. There we go. That's what we were waiting for. One more in Minnesota. Nolan Gorman. Home run derby champion and homers in the all-star game. Trying to wrap up the game. And Edwin Diaz gives up a fly ball to center where Seiya Suzuki will make the catch and seal a National League win, concluding the All-Star break. Nice to spend a little more time with it. It's been something I've simmed past often in this series, and we haven't had a lot of All-Stars or anybody in the Derby until this year, but that was a lot of fun. We got the Derby winner, homeward in the All-Star game. We can move on. We begin the second half of the season, 60 and 36, comfortably up in the central. Want to get us to the end of this month and take a look at our draft picks. Whoa, the A's just got Julius McCann from the Royals for Lane Thomas, George Valera, Connor Phillips. That's, that's a big addition. A 25-year-old shortstop as good as we've seen him before in this series. So, Alexi De La Rosa has a uh, much lower overall and everything than we knew, so I probably won't be signing him. But Kenny Perez only has 38 interest in signing, so I can't even offer a contract yet. I'm not sure I'll get it to a spot where I could offer either. The Diamondbacks want to offer a trade. They want Alexis Diaz. We're just not making that move. We're at 43% on Perez. I think we have to get to 50, and I don't think we have enough days to do it. Can't do it here. Two days until the deadline. We have 48 interest. On top of that, we got the deadline here coming up on the 31st. Do we want to make any moves? We don't have a huge, you know, budget to add a huge salary right now. I have done a lot in the offseason. There's not a starting position that is, you know, 
in need of a major upgrade right now. Donald Galvin, by the way, he's only had 13 at-bats, but he's been making the most of them. He has four hits and two homers, holding it down while Mason Wynn recovers. So one option we have is to now look at all this information we have and maybe just be content with MJ Melendez being the backup catcher. Do we consider sending down Avon Herrera to open up an additional roster spot that we could maybe fill using a trade there are some big names with big salaries on the trade block that we're not going to be looking into lindor and trey turner we had talked about trading for brooks lee at one point still could back up a lot of spots would not be bad depth and mason wins been a bit of a question mark so you wonder if lee could possibly be an upgrade I don't think there's even a need for us to add somebody into the bullpen. And usually you can find one guy you'd like to upgrade. Well, I'm not going to be just like taking out Alexis Diaz, even if his ERA and whip are a little bit high. I still think that we have a really good bullpen still. Even Mason Miller's numbers have come down to a much more palatable range. And even if we don't want Diaz to close games, we have other candidates like Cano and Helsley. So what's on my mind right now is when we get to the postseason, I don't think that the, the lineup and the way everything's laid out necessarily stays the same. At that point, it might make sense to have Marino more so come off the bench, Gorman go back to DH, and then maybe prioritize having better defense there at second. So Donovan's held down third all year, and I think he's doing a fine job of that. I'm not sure there's anything here that'll say he's not. His, uh, his war is way down, though. This does seem like his uh, slugging is definitely uh, much lower. Not really a home run guy to begin with, but only four this year, and even the, the doubles aren't helping make up for it. So I think if there was anything that we could want, it would be an infielder that we could plug in. Mason Wynn can handle that defense well, but he hasn't proven himself this year with the bat. So the Diamondbacks aren't necessarily sellers, but they've always had so much infield depth. I'm going to make a move here for the Diamondbacks that makes a lot of sense for them. And I'm just going to have them move Brooks Lee to third base. He should really be playing over Nolan Arenado. I was considering trading for him, but they're in the hunt. I might have found the guy that makes some sense for us. The Diamondbacks are here, and I moved Brooks Lee to third base for them earlier. I wasn't really aware of Tommy Troy's situation, but check this out first. They have more value on Brooks Lee than Tommy Troy. I have to give up less in a trade. Troy also is out of options and hasn't played phenomenal at the majors whereas Brooks Lee has actually played pretty well for them this season so he's not just stuck on the bench but Troy has been down at AAA and they value him less despite being a higher overall I think we could probably work something out Andres Sanchez one bin show two outfielders I am happy making that move and bringing in Tommy Troy so that gives us another infielder that can't really be sent up and down very easily. But if he's at AAA right now, I'm guessing this is his third option season. Here we can see option has been used. So I can bring him up and send him back down however much I want this year. But what this does is gives us even more options then for handling second base and third. Because we could move, you know, we could keep Gorman at second. We could play either Win or now Tommy Troy there. The other option is to play Donovan at second and somebody else gets to play third base. So there's a ton of ways we could tackle this situation. But Troy being 26 still has upside, but probably missed his chance to become a superstar, which is why they probably value him a little less. But I think with this then, I want to send Donald Galvin then back to AAA. He had been playing pretty well, but he's more limited defensively as far as what he can play. And I would like to now get a deeper look at Tommy Troy, kind of helping us see what is our best situation going into the postseason.
And then I'm thinking back to the Nationals earlier and them offering us Kyle Schwarber, who's been one of the hottest power hitters in the league this season. It wouldn't hurt to have another option coming off the bench because we have two guys that have essentially filled that backup catcher role and Melendez has actually been better than Yvonne Herrera. And you don't have to take on a big salary or give up an amazing prospect to pull off a trade. I'm going to trade them Thomas to Jay-Z, who can play a bunch of positions. He probably won't have a chance to do a whole lot with us because of all the other depth that we have. And he's out of options, so he could get a chance to play there. So we have made two trades now prior to the deadline. I wasn't sure we'd make a single one, but I like these moves for us. We do not add a pitcher, however. So now the bench has that power bat you can call upon. The speedster that can steal a base. We've got a backup catcher who can do more than just that. And then an infielder that can line up in all sorts of different spots for us. And now we're at the deadline. The Cubs are going to make a move here. And they're going to add Trevor Rogers. Just going across the city here. Trevor Rogers joins Chicago as they try to claw their way back into the playoff race. And they are now 53 and 54. So they are a game and a half out of the wild card. We'll see if that helps them out. Oh, it's the deadline also for signing our players. I'm going to get one shot to sign Kenny Perez. So I might as well offer a, a good bonus here then. And he does sign. So we're going to cover a lot of stuff today. A two-home run day for Jordan Walker as we move past the deadline and get win 66. And then Brendan Donovan has a multi-home run game. He had four homers, like, coming into the game. He's going to get two more, helping support a Nestor Cortez start. So we'll wrap things up today, then, by taking a look at our draft picks. How do we do this season? Porter Chance, our number one pick is an 84 overall. And then we've got Kenny Perez at 79, Mikey Deal 83. So a couple B potential players in there. It's not going to be a tremendous class. But we got a couple more players into the system. Perez, really good speed there. And at least his arm has a, an okay starting point. And then Mikey Deal. Already developed pretty well defensively and very fast. 80 overall? Whoa. So his potential is an 83. Mikey Deal. That's not a bad pick. Rocky Damon only a 61. Salas and Garcia are 70s. And then just one more quick glance at our numbers before wrapping things up today. What do you think of our chances of being able to make a postseason run with this roster? The additions today at the deadline were not major, but I don't think this is a team that needed some sort of major push over the top, and we only had so much budget to make moves in the first place. A more aggressive move would have been for a starting pitcher to kind of compete for that fourth spot in the postseason. But considering Lesko is an 82 overall and climbing, I felt like a move there would be a pretty thin chance at an upgrade. And his advanced numbers are pretty fine. And then record-wise, 67 and 41. That will give us the best record in the National League. The Braves lead the East. The Dodgers lead the West. But have four less wins than us. And then the Rangers have 66, Guardians 65, Rays 63. So we are perhaps the best team in baseball. And we'll see where we are going into the postseason. As I believe next episode, we will wrap up August and September and set the stage for another postseason run. Unless we somehow collapse from here. But that'll do it for today. Leave your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for watching the video, and I will see you next time in the Cardinals franchise.